Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Chase Aulis, Program Officer at ACRL, and thank you for joining us for the ACRL Presents webcast, Exhibition Preservation Checklist, Caring for Your Collections on Display, offered today as part of our Celebration of Preservation Week. As a reminder, today's session is being recorded and we'll share the recording link shortly after the webcast. Our presenter today is Rashinda Brim, Head of Preservation at Stanford Libraries at Stanford University. Previously, she held positions in preservation, special projects, and library administration at the Getty Research Library in Los Angeles, California. Rachinda is an active member of the Rare Books and Manuscripts section of ACRL and serves on the steering committee of the California Preservation Program. She has an MLIS from UCLA, and thanks again for joining us. And Rachinda, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you for having me. Um, let's get right into it. So um, thank you for joining me today to learn more about preservation considerations for your collection exhibits. This week is Preservation Week, a week-long celebration and discussion of library and cultural heritage preservation issues, tips, and resources that's organized by the Preservation and Reformatting section of ALEX. If you haven't had a chance to check out the Preservation Week website, you should take some time to look at their resources. There's a link to preservation webinars on YouTube, or you can learn more about this year's honorary chair, genealogist Kenyatta D. Berry, who'll be presenting a webinar tomorrow on preserving family history at 2 p.m. Eastern time. I'm honored today to represent ACRL's Rare Books and Manuscripts section. RBMS's mission is to support and promote librarians and archivists working with special and distinctive collections. At the beginning of April, ACRL shared a number of resources that RBMS has developed to assist with identification, care, and security of collections, mainly primary source, rare books, archives, and manuscript collections. On this slide, you can see a screenshot of some of RBMS's guidelines and standards webpage that shows some of the section's work in this area. I also wanted to mention other places RBMS explores our topic for this morning. At this year's RBMS annual conference, which will be held in Baltimore, June 18th to 21, there will be a discussion session dedicated to exhibits, how to develop them, and how we can make them more sustainable. And in the 2018 issue of RBM, a journal of rare books, manuscripts, and cultural heritage, that is the RBMS journal publication, there's a paper by Michael L. Taylor entitled Special Collections Exhibits, How They Pay Dividends for Your Library. Um, so it's one of the many papers that RBMS has published in their journal over the years that talks about this, um, ex the, about library ex exhibits from a different point of view than conservation. So I've called this presentation the Exhibition Preservation Checklist as a reference to a core exhibition planning document. While exhibition checklists can be as simple as a list of exhibited items, they can also be comprehensive, covering the planning timeline, selection, design, installation, and promotion of your exhibit. But today I'm not going to cover every aspect of exhibition planning or go into all the benefits of exhibitions for education and outreach. Instead, I'm going to specifically focus on the components of a library exhibit or display that directly impact the physical well being of your collection materials. Even when preservation isn't a specific category on an exhibition checklist, it's still implicit in the decisions you make about what you will display, where and how you will display it, and how long it will be on display. When you're setting up an exhibition space or planning an exhibition, you're making collection preservation decisions you might not even be aware of. So we've got a lot to cover today. I wanna to outline the main preservation concerns for collection exhibitions. I'm gonna talk a little bit about selecting for your exhibit, go over some environmental issues, mostly focusing on light levels, make recommendations for display cases and the supports for what go inside your cases, touch on some special considerations for pop-up exhibits, and what to expect and consider if you're borrowing or lending for exhibition. One thing that's really important when planning to share your collections through exhibit is to have a healthy respect for the collection's preservation needs without stressing yourself out about whether or not you're doing it perfectly. There are a lot of best practices out there that can seem impossible to achieve. My hope is that my talk today will help you focus on better preservation practices for your exhibits, if not perfect preservation practices. 
so it is a lot to cover. I'm going to do my best to get through it all in about 30 minutes, which is pretty quick, and hopefully leave a good amount of time for questions before we close today. So let's start off by defining what exactly is an exhibition for our purposes. Exhibitions, of course, come in all sizes and sorts. You might have one case displays or a dedicated exhibition space with multimedia capabilities. Maybe you're doing an event specific pop up exhibit or perhaps you have some collections on permanent or semi permanent display. There's a spectrum of exhibit types. Today I'm primarily going to talk about exhibits that are a public display of your collection material and I'm including both special collections and circulating collections here that's for a set period of time in a dedicated exhibit area. So whether or not you consider your collection exhibitions a full-scale exhibits program or think of them more modestly as, modestly as displays, whether you have a dedicated gallery area or one vitrine or one wall case, whether you have exhibition activities in your job description or you develop ex exhibitions with students or you're thinking about doing your first ever pop-up exhibit, we're going to cover some preservation issues you should consider as you develop your exhibition. So let's dive into some collection preservation fundamentals. This slide shows a list of 10 recognized threats to collections referred to as the agents of deterioration. Uh, the first nine were published in 1994 in the Canadian Conservation Institute newsletter. And the 10th with the little asterisk, the custodial neglect and dissociation was added in 1995. I'm sure all of these are familiar to you, even if a label like custodial neglect seems a little strange. These are things you're already thinking about for your collections in general. So how many of these 10 are concerns for exhibitions? Well, if you're thinking it's all 10, then bravo, because each of these is a definite preservation concern when you put your, collection, your collections on display. But these five in particular, they rise to the top of the list, and we'll focus on them in more detail as they relate to selection, managing exhibition environments, and collection displays. So just to quickly go through these five, physical forces, that would be improper handling during installation or unstable display methods. It can also be something like an earthquake or a roof collapse or heaven help you, a pipe leak that's in your exhibit space. Um, the next one, pollutants, that's off-gassing from materials used in your exhibit case construction or in the gallery design. Those are the pollutant concerns in an exhibit environment. We will discuss some of those issues and how to mitigate poor case environments. Light, this is arguably the biggest issue for collections on display because all light is damaging and paper collections are especially sensitive to light damage. And then finally, temperature and humidity, um, similar to what you probably already know from your storage conditions, temperature and humidity impact long-term preservation of collections. It's the same in your exhibit space. So a lot of what follows about optimal environments and display methods depends on what items you select for your exhibition. This is a critical choice and often sound preservation practices fall prey to exhibit design. If you have conservation support in your institution, that staff might already be a part of the exhibition selection and assessment. Working with a conservator can help identify condition issues that would be exacerbated by prolonged display or anything that has special installation needs. A conservator can also discuss with you when the display risks can and cannot be mitigated. Keep in mind that items needing conservation treatment to stabilize or prepare for display will have some impact on your exhibition timeline. So this is really my plug to work with your conservation staff if you have them early in the selection and design process or consult with an independent conservator if you have any concerns or some potentially complicated collection installations. Finally, if you really want a specific item in your exhibition, but realize it can't be safely displayed, or you don't have the time in your schedule or the money in your budget to have it prepared for safe display, you might consider a high quality facsimile. 
So if you think back just a couple slides um, to the agents of deterioration, four of the five I wanted to focus on were environmental issues. And of those four, light is the biggest concern. Light damage is cumulative and irreversible. You will hear me say that a few times over these next few slides. The longer an item is exposed to light at any level, the more damage is done to that item. So what are the risks of exposure? Uh, light damage, light damages visibly. And so you will see that as discoloration and fading. It also does physical damage, which can present as brittleness in paper or damaged photo surfaces. Paper, photographs, and textiles are the most light sensitive materials in your collections. So when it comes to light, we're concerned about two different sources, natural light and artificial light. Hopefully you only have to manage one, artificial light being at the main source, but you might be dealing with natural light in your exhibit space from windows, from glass doors, or from skylights. Natural light is enormously harmful to collections because it's so bright and it has high levels of ultraviolet radiation unless the light source is filtered. If there's a source of natural light in an exhibit area, it should have shades, screens, or film to minimize the intensity and UV levels. The other source of exposure is artificial light from any of the bulbs and fixtures you have in your exhibition. These should be kept as low as possible and UV filtered if you have fluorescence or halogen bulbs. And this image on the slide is from one of our exhibit spaces. And you can see here, there's this screen in between the columns. There's no natural light getting into this area, but we're trying to minimize some of the ambient um, light that's just in the staircase and in the atrium. So if you look at exhibition lighting recommendations, you're going to see a couple different units of measurement. Um, one is lux and the other is foot candles. Lux is the international standard. That's what we use in our department for our measurements and in our display requirements for borrowers. Um, it's a unit of illumination and it measures the intensity or brightness of light from a light source. If you come across light level recommendations in foot candles, um, it's easy to make a conversion to Lux if you need to. Most light meters do readouts in both Lux and foot candles, and there are conversion calculators on the internet. There's a lot of continuing research into exhibition lighting, predominantly for museums, but obviously applicable to libraries too. Um, two great sources for current research are the Getty Conservation Institute and the Canadian Conservation Institute. Their recent findings are usually available on their websites. So what are the current recommendations for exhibit areas? You're going to be looking for lights set to 50 to 100 lux with the lower levels for your more sensitive media. For comparison's sake, uh, general collection shelving areas are usually set at 300 to 600 lux. Average daylight is 107,000 527 lux, and an overcast day can be as high as 1,075 lux. So how do you figure out what you should do for your own space, and can you compromise on light levels? So you need to know your light levels and how long you can safely expose your exhibited collections, remembering that light damage is cumulative and irreversible. You can use a light meter to measure your lux levels in your exhibit space. They cost about $80 to $130, and they're a really great investment if you're doing a lot of exhibits for your collections. There are also light meter phone apps. Um, I find those readings to be less accurate than actual light meters. In a pinch, that's a good solution for you, though. Uh, once you have your lux readings, you need to know the hours of light exposure. So basically, how many hours a day a week, a month, the total length of time the lights are on in your exhibition. So you need to do a little bit of math here. If the recommended total light exposure for your material is 53,000 lux, and the lights are on in your exhibit area for 10 hours a day, 20 days a month, 
for three month duration, that comes to 600 hours of exposure. So at a level of 50 lux, you could have a print or a book on display the entire time with an exposure level of 30,000 lux total. But that is over half of the recommended total, 53,000. So you would need to carefully consider ever displaying that item again for a, a long, a, for a long exposure for any big length of time. Um, you're going to start seeing perceptible fade once you start hitting the maximum lux level exposure. Because light is damaged, is cumulative and irreversible, there's nothing you can do once you put it back into storage. It's not like it rests and recuperates. It's just the damage has already been done. So for exhibitions of mixed collections that include light sensitive items like watercolors and less sensitive items like glass, you would want to set your light levels for the more sensitive items. And where can you compromise in this? There are some real accessibility considerations when you are setting things for 50 lux. That might be enough light for a 25 year old who has pretty good vision um, to see exhibited text, but that's not gonna work for everyone else that you want coming into your exhibits. So you may consider increasing your lighting to 100 lux, um, rotating pages if you're talking about a, a bound item, or changing out items on display um, if recommended by conservation. Okay, let's move away from light and briefly think about temperature and humidity. For exhibits, we're looking at two related environments, the environment in the exhibition space itself and the environment inside the case. For the most part, there shouldn't be too much of a difference between the two. And if you're monitoring your exhibit space with a data logger, like the one pictured here, which is a PEM2 from the Image Permanence Institute, um, you already have some information about your environments and you can extrapolate from that data for your cases. But if you have any concerns about your exhibit case being a microchamber that might have a different environment than outside that could be harmful for the um, collections that you want to display inside that case, you can put a data logger in your case, do some readings and get some idea of what's going on and perhaps how you can mitigate it. Of course, display is not the same as storage and the environment in your exhibit area will most likely be warmer than your storage area for visitor comfort. That would be a consideration for certain collection materials like photograph displays, and you might want to do exhibit prints of those if they're available. In all cases, a more stable environment in your ex exhibition area is the best for your collections on display. Okay, so let's move right on to exhibit cases. Um, an exhibit case constructed of stable materials can help protect your collections from all five of those agents of deterioration. Um, that's physical force, pollutants, light, temperature, and humidity. And if you have a problematic case, you might be able to mitigate the problem area. Uh, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, which is known as um, NEDCC, has great information on cases as well as other exhibit preservation issues. I'll be referring to them a couple times in this section and they are on my resource slide at the end of this talk. So if you're buying a new case, what should you invest in? You want stable materials that don't off-gas harmful pollutants into the case interior that put your collections at risk. It's easier to start with a case made from good materials than to mitigate the case. You're looking for cases that are made with anodized aluminum or coated steel, just like library shelving recommendations. You're looking for fabrics. You want undyed cotton, linen, polyester and cotton poly blends. And you wanna know about the adhesives and gaskets that are used in the case construction too that might degrade and off gas into the interior of your case. What case materials should you avoid? It's a pretty short list. It's basically woods and plywoods. If there are wood components, they're best kept separate from the case interior. On this slide, um, in the detail down here at the bottom, you can see that the bonnet, the glass part on top, is glass and then metal here, 
and then there's fabric on the deck at the bottom. There's a wood base, but it's a um, completely separate component from the interior of the case. So anything that's off-gassing from this wood base would not reach anything displayed inside the glass and metal bonnet. Uh, you can see it's kind of similar up here. There's a wood base, but then there's a separate bonnet with a separate fabric deck. Exhibit cases made with wood and plywood are often more affordable than aluminum or steel cases. So if budget is a deciding factor for a new case, look for more stable woods and plywoods. NEDCC has great lists of some of those options. Um, they mention softwoods like poplar and basswood, and they also say that hardwoods like African mahogany are possible choices for your exhibit cases. If you do need to mitigate harmful materials, there are some options. You can use passive barriers like mylar or marble seal that block volatile emissions from woods and paints. And there are active barriers like microchamber board and paper that trap those pollutants. I strongly recommend going to the NADCC website for more detailed information on barriers, sealants, and coatings. But I do want to mention desiccants. You can use desiccants to correct humidity issues inside your cases, especially during seasonal fluctuations. Specifically, you can use silica gel, which comes in sheets and beads and cartridges, but to use it effectively, you need to follow the supplier's instructions and calculate the right amount of size for your of silica for the size of your case. And cases too, I can point up to this top picture here. This is a drawer underneath the deck of the um, display area, and you can usually um, do mitigation within the drawer using silica gel in there to correct for any humidity issues that you might be having. So we're going to continue with display cases, but once again, we're going to think about lights. Um, this time we're talking about lights inside your cases. Having uh, lights in the cases can be tricky because they can concentrate bright light on one item or one area of an item resulting in an uneven exposure damage. Depending on what kind of light you use, they can also heat up the interior of your case. So the top picture on this slide, it's a little hard to read, but right here, there's an interior light on the left side. It's not turned on. Um, it really puts a lot of raking light down into the case interior. And this case in this gallery um, has more general lighting above, which is preferable um, and works in this situation here. On the bottom is a detail of some fiber optic lights in a standing case. These are all divots for a whole set of fiber optic lights at the top of the case. And here's a shot of that case with the fiber optic lights. Um, I think this is a good example of uh, good internal case lighting because the light is diffused over the entire interior of all the objects in the case. There's no spotlighting to be concerned about here. This is kind of the ideal that you want if you're gonna be doing internal case lighting. So leaving cases, let's move on now to displaying your items safely inside the case. Uh, we'll start off with flat paper. There are four display methods to consider. The first is pretty lo-fi. Basically, you want to have any flat item on top of a supporting piece of archival board, especially if you need to protect that item from wood or another unstable surface inside your case. Ideally, the piece on display is secured with a thin mylar strap or with corners made from archival material. In the image on this slide, it's a little hard to see, but every item is on a piece of rag board. You might be able to see the board edges peeking out underneath right here. And these are some installation shots of individual sheets. On the left, you see the rag board laid out for positioning in the case. And on the right, each sheet has been strapped to a piece of board with thin strips of mylar. You can't see them in this picture, but there's a thin strip of mylar on the left and the right side of each of these sheets. Um, this protects the sheet from overhandling, one of the agents of deterioration being physical force. 
um, during placement and positioning, as well as protection from the case surface if necessary. And you can see that it visually, it's pretty unobtrusive. You can't really tell that there is anything underneath those sheets once you have the display all set up. Next on the list for flat paper display is matting. Um, a window mat offers support for flat paperwork and also protection for any delicate media like pastels, charcoals, photograph surfaces, especially if they're not being framed. Mats can also be used for storage after your exhibit comes down. Um, the one thing to consider is that they'll probably require a professional framing service unless you have some in-house expertise and capacity to do this kind of exhib exhibition prep yourself. Um, that could impact your exhibit installation timeline and of course be part of your budget considerations for exhibit. And then framing is the best solution you have for any flat paper item that will be hung vertically. The critical issue here is the separation of the item from the glazing. You never want an image surface directly against glass or plexiglass. That's where these mats come in and window mats provide a little bit of distance between your, this is a photograph here, but your, um, the surface of your item and the actual framing and glazing. Um, a frame with UV coated glazing also protects the piece from light damage and then you also get the protection from handling during installation. You do want to make sure that mats are made from archival materials and that the framed piece is protected from any frame components that are made of wood. And then finally on this list there's encapsulation. It's the last on my list for a reason. If there's no other option it's acceptable but it does have some drawbacks and mainly the use of adhesives for construction and specifically any use of double-sided tape. The concern with the adhesive is that it can spread and move over time creeping toward the encapsulated item or if the item is hung vertically it can slip down into the adhesive strip. So finally we're going to look at some options for displaying your bound items. With books and other bound items, it's best and easiest to display them horizontally or at a slight angle. You want to support the book at a comfortable opening. You never want to force it into position and being sensitive to, you want to be sensitive to tight, fragile, or complex bindings. For supports, you can buy pre-made acrylic cradles or use polyethylene foam blocks that you might already have in your reading room or you can make custom cradles out of archival board, as, which is what's in one of the picture, in one of the pictures on the slide. Um, custom cradles can be as simple or complex as you need, depending on the items and the length of the exhibit. A custom cradle does require some in-house calculations for the angle of opening, but there are a number of good online tutorials if you simply search for custom book cradle. In this picture, you get um, a example of some of the variety of cradles. This is a very simple board support for this opening of this one bound item in the front and then in the back we have something that is in a, um, a vendor's plexiglass cradle. So finally once your binding is properly supported you can secure the page openings with a strap which is similar to the strapping that's used for the board mounted flat paper I already talked about. On this slide, I've got two examples of a simple mylar strap for a page opening of a book that's on exhibit. Finally, you'll want to schedule in page rotations for your books on display based on your light level calculations because you want to limit the exposure on the displayed opening. And now a quick word about security for exhibited collections, which you might remember is also one of the agents of deterioration. Um, you should be protecting your exhibited collections from the threat of external and internal theft. At the very least, you should have locks on your exhibit cases. If possible, your exhibit areas should also have video surveillance that can provide a record of all access to the cases and the visitors in your exhibit space. And it's even better if there can be a guard because visible security presence is the best deterrent to theft. To guard against internal theft, you want all of the above, plus good documentation of who has access to what and when for a clear audit trail of collection movement. And now I just want to think a little bit about pop-up exhibits. Uh, these can have slightly different considerations than traditional exhibits because of their brevity. 
They are usually event specific for a lecture or a conference or a reception. They might not be in a regular exhibit space. So you want to carefully think about how you are safely and securing transporting, securely transporting your collection items for display. Will there be an exhibit case? It's one of the questions that you should be considering if you're going to be doing a pop-up. Also, what do you need to safely install your collections for a pop-up? Can you position the case to limit light exposure, especially natural light exposure? Will staff be stationed at the case? If there is no case, what staff will be there with collections to protect them from handling or theft? And if this is a reception with food and drink, are there measures in place to protect collections like clear signage prohibiting any food or drink around the display? Finally, let's talk about lending and borrowing for exhibitions. If you want to borrow collections from another institution or a private individual, you should be prepared to provide some information about your exhibit space, your operations, your insurance, and maybe even pay a borrowing fee. The first thing you should do if you want to borrow from an institution is look to see if they have their lending policy posted online. If there is one online, it should clearly lay out any fees they charge, and how much lead time they need to consider and fill your request. If you are getting a request to lend your own collections for exhibit and you don't have lending policies, you should sit down and develop some to help manage the process of sending your collections to other institutions. This screenshot is of our Stanford Library's exhibition lending policy. Um, there's a summary at the top that talks about how we judge um, whether or not we will lend something. It's nice to be very clear about what your criteria are. And then there's a link to the um, fees that we do charge for borrowing our collection materials. A key component of borrowing and lending collections is having a facilities report, which covers your building, your environmental conditions, conservation and installation operations and staffing, security and disaster response procedures. As a borrower, you should be prepared to provide a facilities report with any request to borrow items for exhibit. As a lender, you should request a facilities report and be clear on where you will and will not negotiate on lending your collections. The American Alliance of Museums has a standard facilities report that's accepted around the world. It's a lengthy document, it's 40 plus pages, and it might require coordination across multiple departments to complete. As a lending institution, if you do approve a loan, you can specify detailed requirements for light levels, supports, shipping, and courier needs, if any. As a borrower, you should be prepared to meet all the requirements for the loan agreement. If you can't meet those requirements, you might be able to request facsimiles for exhibition instead of the actual item. Okay, so we covered a lot this morning. Um, I wanna give you a few links to some good resources. The NADCC's website, and especially their preservation leaflets, have a lot of good information on light exposure and case construction. The AIC Conservation Wiki has a section just on standards and guidelines for exhibitions. It might go into more depth from a conservation perspective than you need for your purposes, but it could give you a good foundation to discuss concerns with a conservator. And finally, the RBMS guidelines for interlibrary and exhibition loan are an excellent place to think through what goes into lending and borrowing for an exhibition. So before I open it up for questions, I have a few thank yous. I borrowed a lot of images from our conservation services team here, and I took a lot of snapshots of cases in a couple of our library spaces. So thanks to all of my Stanford colleagues for indulging me as I hovered around their displays. Any questions, um, you can reach me over email or on one of our social media channels. We are on Twitter and Instagram, and I am happy to take some questions here now. Thanks, Rachinda. And yeah, if you, anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we will get to those. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Okay, looks like we have a question from Annie. For exhibits, is there a preference between LED or fiber optic lighting? I think people are starting to move towards LEDs. Um, and we're seeing a lot of research about that come out from the Getty Conservation Institute. Some of that is for sustainability reasons. Um, and also there's some research that's just starting to come out that you can get, um, you can actually have higher light levels if you're using LEDs. That's very new. Nobody has changed any of their recommended light level standards yet. Um, but just recently talking to a lighting designer, he said that he thinks there's gonna be some movement in that. We'll see how quickly that happens. But um, I do think that people are starting to opt more for LEDs. We'll watch what museums are doing because they're gonna be the first adopters for that. Um, but yeah, there could be some changes coming in that exhibit arena. And then we have another question from Lori. Does wood off gas for its entire lifetime or does the amount decrease over time? Oh, good question. Um, I think it, the off-gassing levels will go down, but it's always going to have some acidic component. Um, it's, it's definitely something that you want to be, um, if you need to have wood in your exhibit area, in your exhibit case, um, you're going to have to be sealing it or protecting your stuff from it for however long you have that case. Thanks for these great questions, everybody. And uh, please keep uh, typing them in if you have them. Thank you. Okay, a question from Shannon. From a preservation standpoint, is there a standard length of time that a single item should be on display? Likewise, is there a time over which a single item should not be displayed? That is a great question. There are a lot of guidelines out there that are media specific. So I was just looking at the AIC's um, photo materials group wiki and they have pretty detailed um, exposure lengths for all sorts of different kinds of photographs. So we're talking anywhere from the most sensitive things um, only being out like ambro types are a good example only being out for um, like a thousand hours. So it really depends on what you are putting in your exhibit. For things like um, a lot of color media, pastels, um, color photographs, those are gonna be textiles that have a lot of dyes. That's going to be um, some of the more sensitive stuff that will be on display for the least amount of time. And then it goes all the way up to glasses and ceramics and um, stone pieces that can be on display for a much longer period of time. Um, you see recommendations of things like 50,000 hours for some of your uh, most sensitive media. And that is over the entire length of that object's existence. Um, ideally, I mean, if you have things out on permanent display, you're just um, you're just watching them fade over time. That's that is a non-negotiable. Um, it's really helpful if you can, and this can be tricky because this can be a, a, a data management issue for your for your library. Um, if you can keep track of what you have put on exhibit and how long it's been on exhibit, that's going to be helpful. Um, for historical records, if you want to put it out in a couple years, if somebody wants to borrow it. Um, we've had this come up with one request to loan the suite of prints by Henri Matisse, the jazz prints. That's um, a very, they're, they're beautiful. They are intensely colorful. Um, we know they've been out on, on exhibit before, so we're trying to limit how much they go out in the future um, and we have we have denied requests for them um, because we were concerned that they were going to start showing some um, true fade in those vibrant colors excellent and then we have one more question from Lori. what's the best way to secure the ends of the straps that you put around an open book page or item on a mat yeah you can just use some double-sided tape it's pretty um forgiving because it won't be anywhere near your item. So we do that a lot. It's, um, it's, it's pretty quick. Um, 
um, and it's uh, it's pretty easy to do. So once you get some practice down, you can use some double-sided scotch tape. And there is a recommendation on the IEDC side of a specific tape that's especially good because it doesn't um, it doesn't creep as much as the adhesive doesn't move around as much as other adhesives do. Okay, we still have time for questions if anybody has them. These are all great questions. Okay, we have another question from Lori. What's the best way to secure the ends of the straps that you put around an open book page? Oh, sorry, excuse me. Can you talk about using snake weights on display items? Yeah, I, um, sometimes that's an aesthetic concern, which is why I think people tend to use the polyethylene or mylar straps. Um, I would say it should be the, the lighter one. It really depends on, on what your opening is like, because I, I would imagine you're thinking about keeping a page down in an opening on a bound item. Um, I think it's, it's, it's tough to know without talking it through. This is such a conservator answer. Like, I don't know until I see it. Um, but it, I think for, for most people, it is about the um, aesthetic quality of having it in the case. Um, they're not as transparent. They're not as unobtrusive as a mylar strap or a polyethylene strap. But if that's what you've got um, and you can use one of the lighter kind of bead snake weights instead of a, a bigger, heavier cloth one, then that might be the best solution for what you can do for your materials. Okay, another question from Shannon. What do you think of those velvet curtains some museums and libraries use to cover sensitive items? I think that's a, a great solution. I mean, we have talked about it. What's, not so much velvet curtains, but um, also just like linen screens or having a, a little shade that you roll back from a case when you want to view something or if you need to limit the exposure even once your lights go down. The other um, option for limiting light exposure is to have, this is a, a pretty um, fancy case modification if you have it, but is to have lights that only come on when somebody is standing in front of it or that people can click off and on. Um, so only when it's actually being viewed is it getting any light exposure. Um, and just on another point that I'm, I don't think I mentioned this in the talk, but if you don't have people, we have this in some of our spaces, if you don't have people um, actually actively looking at an exhibit, but you're in that room, um, at least turn the case lights off. If you need to have the general lighting on, that's fine, but the case lights, if there are case lights or specifically um, focused case lights in your exhibit area, uh, you can turn those off if you're not technically um, having visitors in to look at your materials. All right, we still have a little time for questions if anybody has any more, one or two more, I think. Um, Marchena, thank you for answering all these great questions. Yeah, my pleasure, they are great. Oh, we have one more for Shannon. Are there trainings available for staff without these skills to learn more about preparing displays? 
Um, I would go to the NADCC website and also the preservation um, and reformatting section YouTube channel. There are some out there that have, show some um, like strapping and maybe making some cradles. Um, really great groups like uh, Laracis and um, CCHA often have workshops for um, doing exhibits prep that you might wanna get on their mailing list um, if you want to do more of this um, for your own institution. And there's also, if you just Google around, um, I didn't, I didn't wanna overwhelm the resources slide, but I found some really great blog posts just about doing your own custom cradles. Um, a great one from Molly Schwartzberg about doing miniature um, book cradles, uh, did some great pictures and a uh, step-by-step -step that she got advice from one of her conservation staff for doing that. So there's some really great resources out there if you want to uh, start to learn to do some of the more uh, lower hanging fruit kind of installations. Great, and then we have one more from Lori. Uh, can you talk about the blue wool cards for measuring light damage? Yeah, um, I wish I had my notes right in front of me. Uh, that is a great way to see for more sensitive items, especially for textiles, about how long it takes for different kinds of dyes and sensitive materials to start to fade. I mean, you can start to see really perceptible fade with those blue wool cards. Um, the other thing that you can do, it's um, not everybody uses this or thinks it's very reliable, but you can also do Audi testing if you're concerned about pollutants inside your cases. Um, this goes back to the discussion about microchambering. If, if, you're, if your case is becoming its own little microchamber, its own little environment with um, off-gassing or uh, temperature changes, especially for off-gassing of um, volatile pollutants, you can do Audi testing, which is basically gonna tell you if there's anything in your case that's corrosive, and it's specifically for metals, but you can understand a lot about what's going on in your case if you use these little Audi testing coupons. So yeah, blue wool testing, um, great for understanding the light damage risks that you have for your materials on display and then audi testing for pollutant risk thanks again everyone for all of these great questions and thank you richina for answering all these amazing questions um, if you're okay to take one or two more, we can keep questions open or... Um, yeah, that's yeah? fine. Okay. And again, if anybody has questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, even if everyone doesn't see them, we do see them, so. Okay, I think that might be it for questions. Um, and uh, everyone, Rochinda's contact information is right there on the screen. So if you have follow-up questions you think of later, feel free to reach out to her. And I wanna thank Rochinda for uh, doing this presentation for us during Preservation Week. And thank you everyone for your great questions and for coming. Yeah, um, thank you everybody. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah, and please and we, get in touch if you have questions. Yeah, and we'll be posting the link to this recording um, on our website, and it will go out to everyone who registered. So you all will be able to register to reference this presentation again if you need to. So thank you everyone for attending, and uh, we're going to sign off now. Great, thanks. Thank you.